Welcome back to Tying That Guy. I'm Wes Chatham. This is my good friend, Ty Frank, and also good pal, Keon Alexander. What's up, man? How are you, brother? How you good doing? To good you. to see you, man. Yeah, thank you for having uh, me. Before we get started, we wanted to, on behalf of all the fans and people that love The Expanse, there's something we want to uh, do for you. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> nah, that's good. <laughs> that was Ty's idea. He's like, man, we should that's... rough him up in the beginning. At all the... I you, figured... you hurl rocks at Earth, there's going to be consequences. I figured if we took an audience poll of the best way to spend 45 minutes with you, <laughs> the audience would overwhelming you both and beat the shit out of him. All right, that's all right. I'm okay with that. My lawyer is standing right there. <laughs> I want to tell the this, this story when I first met you. You and I studied acting at the, at the same place for a long time. Same coach. Yeah, it was the same coach. And I remember coming in one day and there was... It was, it was in the middle of a scene and you were on stage doing a scene and I remember seeing this in Washington and I thought it was a great scene and it was great work and then afterwards uh, I remember the coach and you were talking about the scene and I saw you like defending your choices and having really smart well thought out articulate you know things and I was like wow that's a really smart actor and this so is uh, even back then he was not directable <laughs> <laughs> so clear <Hashtag> back. Difficult <laughs> not not directable. he has a clear yeah you and, haven't changed uh, it all man <laughs> yeah and then cut to I see you on this I'm like hey man we, we yeah, remember right? like that moment of like seeing each other and uh and, it, and it's interesting because it's like Working with her is like having a shared lineage in a way. Like, yeah. you know that the people that work with her are invested and are- Nancy Banks. Is, Nancy yeah. Banks is yeah. her name. She's amazing, pouring their heart in. And so it was interesting before even having met you, I already felt an affinity. I was like, okay, this is, this is another one of those, those artists that's like in it with all of their being. Right. So, so speaking of that- Then I met you. <laughs> and then you're like, how did this guy slip through the cracks? Well, and there, there were other connections too, because when we hired Keon, immediately Kara G was like, oh, I love Keon. I've worked with him on the stage a bunch. Like, yeah. it, like apparently you guys had- It wasn't together. really what she said. But okay, I'm doing the nice version oh, for okay, the Okay, like, okay yeah. I get it, I get it. But yeah, we, we, it's really interesting that, that the training that Kara and I did, which was very different than what we had in common, was- Japanese based, very intense, very warrior like training. Hmm. We, I mean, we've remained friends, she's one of my closest people, but it we came full circle with this project, both playing warriors who, in a lot of ways, mirror each other but are going in completely different directions. So, it, I don't think it's an accident that we have that shared training in common, hmm. but it's a trip, it's beautiful magic that we met up in this way. Well, speaking of process and speaking, um, how did this role come to you and how did you start to break it down? What was your process in bringing Marco to life and creating him? Well, as I've said before with you, I think the, uh, the Craigslist ad is what's responsible for me being on this show. <laughs> that was for uh, another purpose. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, hey, if you're good at this, how about play Marco? <laughs> You'll just fish me in. <laughs> um, well, I was familiar with the show. Obviously, my friend Kara was already on it at that point. My first foray was into the books. And then basically what I've had to do all along, and, and it's hard to do this being on Twitter, but I've had to bracket a lot of the judgments of this human being. I, have, I literally had to remove even my own perception of who he is on the spectrum of good, bad, whatever, and, and just find a way to, apart from his actions, see him for the little seedling that he was in the belt that grew into what he was, and, and find a way to trace the tra trajectory of what his psychology was that led to this point. So, it, it was really important for me to go way back to the beginning in order for him not to just be the, the two-dimensional archetype of, of what he is. And that's why to this day I still resist the, the, the labels of evil or bad or especially the T word because those easy labels betray the, like, the dimensions and the depth of humanity and the, the real like injustices that lead to someone being able and being willing to do such horrendous things. And so I, I've had to be his champion in a lot of ways. And I think it's, it was a real gift from the books to have uh, insight into his psychology. Like you guys planted some really beautiful seeds there that 
I just sort of like ran with. And, and the most fulfilling thing about this for me, from Marco, has been that, that those seeds that you planted, I don't know if I've said this before, but I studied political philosophy. So I've, I'm interested in the state of the world and I'm interested in, in where we're heading on a, at a bigger level, which apparently some other people in this room are also interested in. And, and so a lot of my frustrations and a lot of the, the, the like, um, the, the injustices that were like firing me up, I, I poured into this guy and like, I really feel like as a society, for instance, we're, we're taking a turn towards deeper and deeper narcissism, not just on an individual level, but on a, on a collective level, in a, in a way where we are becoming so separate from each other, like cancer cells are, like cancer cells are, are egoistic and only concerned about themselves to the degree that they'll replicate to the detriment of the whole, a tumor, you know, just like I will accumulate, accumulate, accumulate. And I feel like that's the direction that, go, that we're going in. So the seeds that you planted, immediately sort of like like meshed with my feeling of like, yes, this man is a symbol of where we are headed if we do not check some of that narcissism that's going to a place where it cannot coexist with the whole of all humanity, it cannot co co coexist in a community. And so to me, that's cathartic for me to pour in a lot of those feelings I have about society into Marco as a symbol. It's interesting because we were, Wes and I were talking to Dominique a little while ago, and one thing she mentioned is one of her favorite lines of this season is when Drummer is talking to Vassarola in, in a later episode, and she says, after centuries of oppression, Marco was inevitable. Yeah. That you made this. Yeah. You created this by grinding people down, by making them feel hopeless, making them feel like they didn't have a future. You created this thing. Yeah. Um, the fact that Marco has valid points is a theme running through this season. That yeah. that the anger that he has is justified anger. Now, the actions he takes may not be justified, yeah. but the, the anger, anger that drives them. Yeah. What I think is fascinating is that when you have an, a, a karmic imbalance like that and the way that Earth was treated the belt and what the belt went through, those rocks coming back is like a physical mm. manifestation of that energy coming back. Those are the chickens coming home Those to roost. Those are the chickens coming totally, home to man. roost. Yeah. Totally. And what I love about the expanse is that if Marco does inhabit the antagonistic position, but when you hear him speak and when you hear him talk, you're like, he's got a fucking point. Yeah. You know, he's got a he's got a point. And I think how far can we all be pushed to when we start making those decisions? Yeah. And I know if I look at myself honestly, it's not too far. And, uh, you know, and, and, and that's what is so fascinating about this character is that he, he does these horrible things, but you have to look at him and say, that makes sense. It's motivated. It's fully justified. It's not, it's not, it's grounded in something that's true. Yeah, man. What, I mean, and this is, I, I honor you guys and, and Rain and, and the producers and all the writers for allowing that complexity to remain unanswered and for that full spectrum to exist because what do you expect someone to do in the face of tyranny really really truly like we have the easy answers that we might get from our textbooks or from the news or from our educational system and but the, the answers are really not that easy if you're willing to look outside of the power holders status quo mm -hmm. like if you if you really go and look at the person who's suffering what do you expect them to do and this is what it comes down to with marco and what i've really like i hope that i've like somehow been able to capture the heart that underlies all of this like bullshit and mania and egoism and, and vanity and all of that stuff on top is that in his heart of hearts at the root of it he is a young single father with a child, with a baby, and he vows that he, that baby will never have the experiences of injustice, oppression, and having his humanity betrayed and denied ever. He's like, okay, how many years do I have? I, in my lifetime, I will do nothing but invest in the fact that my son will not feel this denial of his humanity, and I will make, I'll do whatever it takes to make that happen for him. Now, is he the best father? <laughs> no, <laughs> but 
what it what I've constantly been trying to play with is that underneath it all, all is this love and this devotion, which you as a father must understand is like because it's if there for were, him. If, if there wasn't that love, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't be as powerful. I, I mean, yeah. I don't know if 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 the fuel would be enough for him to be willing to carry the weight of what he's willing to carry. Like it's literally for that son. And there's a lot psychologically in the way for him that prevents him from being able to express that love. And we see a lot of that in season six. And I'm, I love that that plays out. And we, we really get to the archetype of, and it's really like fathers and sons. It's like, and it's really like men. It's really like, there's a difficulty in expressing what we really feel because of our notions of what masculinity is. There's, there's a generational gap in the emotional intelligence to be able to connect in ways that we really want to. So we, you know, like we, we go get a drink or we go fishing or we like sports or whatever. But I really feel like we were getting close to capturing the essence of that archetype, like fathers and sons and generational gap, like everything that stands in the way of, of expressing that love, even though it may be your like your root mission, which it is for Marco. Well, and I also think I, I agree with what you were just saying, uh, and especially as far Every, as the everything, I everything just, you were just saying. Thank you, hundred percent. For the record, um, <laughs> what your insight is that I think is interesting and just triggered in my head is nothing stays pure. Mm. So I think there probably was a pure moment for oh, Marco yeah. at the beginning when he sees this baby and he says, "I will make the world a better place for yeah. you." A lot of things happen and you know there's a lot of road goes past and a lot of a lot of speed bumps and, and a lot of changes, compromises a lot of compromises and it and so the purity of that moment goes away mm -hmm. but i think the triggering moment can still be a pure moment mm -hmm. and i i can absolutely see that with marco that he mm -hmm. starts out with this pure intention mm -hmm. i will make the world a better place for mm -hmm. you and he maybe loses sight of some of the reasons why he started it yeah and uh his compl the complexity of his feelings for his son change and warp some of it. But I think the starting point is that pure moment. I think he held that kid and he said, oh, I'm gonna fix the world for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And everything that follows comes from that. Yeah, yeah, totally, man. And and I think that a lot of the shit that gets in the way is actually, like there's a whole field of research into colonial psychology. And that's something that I happen to be familiar with and was able to like infuse into this is that, in order for him to go from that pure feeling of wanting to make the world a better place for his son to actually being the person that could carry that out, he had to have the bandwidth and the intelligence and the self-awareness in order to architecturally become the perfect uh, example of that colonial psychology. Like he literally had to understand what success meant to that that infrastructure and he had to mimic understand become that thing and i mean this answers the tattoo question that a lot yeah. of people ask over and over again is is that this human being has the intelligence and the capacity to become somebody that is worthy of being idolized even within the colonial model but he had to contort and and metamorphosize himself code shift understand the difference in psychologies between not just his people, but the people that are ruling over him in order to meet them, in order to come face to face and not just uh, emulate the colonial system, but take it down. And that, that level of contortion, that level of, um, of willingness to deny whatever your essence is and become what, needs, what you need to become in order to carry out your bigger mission, that's some real like, fuckery at the psychological well, it's, level. And it's a behavior we see over and over again. And in fact, it's a baby, behavior we saw even in season one of the show, which is Detective Miller taking on the affectation mm -hmm. of Earthers. Mm -hmm. Because for him, growing up as a poor kid on series, um, the symbols of power, the symbols of success were all Earth things. So the hat and, yeah. the, and the clothes yeah. and, and the manner of speaking yeah. and, and trying to hide his belterness. Yeah. Um, because you're trying to take the power for yourself that you see in these other people and, yeah. and the ways in which that sort of warps people. Let's talk about that a little bit because uh, we, we love to talk about process, you know, as in, you know, and so how did what you're saying now and the choices that you made and how you dress and how you walk and how you talk, how did you make those choices to bring Marco to life in that way? <laughs> 
I it with no tattoos. You know, go into the why you don't have any tattoos and and. I incessantly harass Ty and Daniel and Narain <laughs> because this is the type of person who sees himself as larger than life so in terms of self perception.、Mm-hmm. So that means, and he is the person like we have just been discussing who's contorted himself and architecturally constructed himself in a very self aware aware way to become who he is. And so every single thing is intentional. Every single.、Uh, Hair on his head is intentionally placed, and not just intentionally placed. In general, specifically, he code shifts constantly, and this is something that I hope comes through, or maybe with rewatching can be picked up on. Is that every single person that Marco engages with, he is he is code switching between because he has a keen awareness of human psychology, and what others may call manipulation. He himself experiences as metamorphosis. This person requires this for me to achieve what I want to achieve from this person. I need to be aware of their psychology and change according to what they need to bring about that outcome. Right? Yeah. And that includes whether or not he has tattoos, or how his hair is placed, what his facial hair is like, what his accent is like, how he carries his body. There's something really. Animal about him, and I already felt that from the way that、yeah. you guys depicted him in the books. So that was something that I had so much fun playing with. Is like, how is he in his like visceralness using his body to specifically get what he wants from this human being, as opposed to that human being, as opposed to that human being? So he's, I mean, he's a piece of work. He's constantly changing, and so of course his his hair or facial hair or his clothes are going to be different. Like. His I I love and he loves the harness that、yeah. he wears. Like that is like every time I put that on, that was like that that was one of my clicks. Is like, well, and he definitely wears it in times that are not appropriate. Like I swear he sleeps sleeps with it because it's just it's the feeling. It's the feeling of like what he's trying to achieve. And what's cool about season six is that for the first time we start seeing the cracks. Well, his, I do want to talk. I want to talk about his fatal flaw. Yeah.、Um, but before that, though, I, I I remember how excited you got when I came to you and I said, "What do you think if if Marco keeps Ashford's guns? Yeah. Like the you know those two big sort of、uh, yeah. self propelled guns. Yeah, man. And and you wind up with one, and and、uh, Josai winds up with one. Yeah, man. But I said, I said, what what do you think? And and he just like his eyes lit up. He's like, of course he would keep them. <laughs> it's the trophies of his dead enemy. You know,、totally. like it's it's such a status move of like, you know, I have this badass gun and I took it from the baddest motherfucker in the belt, and I've and now it's mine. And then、yeah. already planning ahead. <laughs>、yeah. Oh, what would drummer feel if she saw me holding, holding the、this? gun? Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, like eight steps ahead, ten steps ahead. So, so well,、yeah. but the I think I want to mention about his face. So. And this drives a lot of the scenes that are coming up in this era in this episode. Is Marco's fatal flies rage,、mm. and he makes a choice in this episode, driven entirely by rage and this need to punish people、mm. for having gone against him. That really begins to s- start his slow topple.、Mm. Um, that choice that he makes that I must kill the Rossinate.、Mm. There's no reason to do it.、Mm-hmm. They're not in our way.、Mm-hmm. But these people have defied me and embarrassed me, and they must die.、Mm-hmm. And it, that's a key word, isn't it? The embarrassment. So in this scene, when you go to the Rasenante and you are face to face with Holden, what、yeah. does Marco think of Holden? What is his point of view? <sighs> I mean, to answer that question, we have to go to Naomi. Naomi, I really believe, is one of the few. Pure experiences of his life. I don't think he ever expected, and we saw some of his like. He actually spoke some truth when they got came face to face because、yeah. the stakes were that high that he allowed himself to pull those facades away for a moment when faced with her and, and almost feeling naked before her. We we see that. He did not expect for that rupture to happen. He even says so much,、yeah. and I think that he he would never use the word regret. I don't think he believes in regrets. But if there were anything in his life that he regrets, is the loss of Naomi. And I think he's never had an experience like that before in his life. 
And I don't think he's the type of person to let that go <laughs> ever. And so if the person that scoops her up in her in, in that moment is an earther who is, has been doing what he's doing, he, I mean, he's definitely going to have some strong feelings towards that human being <laughs> for sure. And it's so cool in this episode to see that moment where they go eye to eye for the first time. Because when I first read that in the books, I was like, yes, that is so good. Because there's something, there's something mirroring about it. Mm -hmm. It's like, I think you guys even say, like, it's almost like looking at yourself. A less good looking version, but yeah, um, of course. <laughs> <laughs> that was Marco, was not me? Um, I love Stephen, and he's beautiful. Uh, just kidding. Where uh, do the lines begin? <laughs> Where does oh, Marco end? Oh, oh, I've been brain. detoxing. I can't even tell you. I call I call Kara up, and I'm like, I need to do some detoxing. Yeah. Do you walk around your apartment in your harness and like <laughs> and give it one? Um, talk about the decision that you made when you revealed your son to Holden. In that scene. Yeah, again, like everything this piece of work does is intentional. And I don't know if he even would have made that call if it wasn't for that plan to ex and and the forethought to have placed him right there with that camera, not the other camera, that camera. Yeah. It's all strategic. It's all mm -hmm. strategic. And he, I mean, he would not go into battle without a backup plan. He's the kind of person. You must person, always have a knife in the darkness. Yeah, and you must have a backup knife and a backup knife yeah. for that backup knife and a backup, you know? So he had a plan if he were to ever go face to face in like a tantric meeting with that guy, there will be something to give a little stab, and it's that. And he also knows that Naomi's probably watching too. Mm -hmm. So he, there's, a mul there's multiple things achieved from that one slide over of his chair. And I love that because it's so subtle, but so It's that so moment harsh. of, hey, Naomi, your boyfriend's about to kill your kid. Exactly. And it's such a, it's such a middle finger. <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 Um, one of the things that, uh, that I want to talk about is that what do you think, Marco, how is he different from when we first see him to the end? Wow. I mean, something that's been really important important to me is to try and capture and I mean as you know it's like there's a lot of moving pieces and you actually don't know how things are going to be edited in the end so it's to build a mega arc is sometimes challenging in this in this medium but my intention was always to really show how he goes from a, a freedom fighter who finds that position as military leader who evolves to his wet dream come true <laughs> on the throne, as I keep joking, which is where we meet him at the beginning of this season. And then, and this is the part that I'm really grateful that we get to show is that moment where, like, especially because even though he is a part of the oppressed class, he is still working within a capitalist matrix that treats you and, and makes your identity revolve around what you achieve, right? And so his whole achievement, it's not about who you are, you don't have inherent value, you are accomplishment-based. And so what happens when you've dedicated your whole life to achieving X and then you get it? What next? And so we find him at the top of season six with in the middle of an existential crisis because his dream just came true. But did he get it? It's not fully complete. It's not fully completed, but he's he's now switching from military leader to to governor of of the the, the socio political system, and that that is not interesting to him. He's he he yeah. has been accomplishment based and adrenaline based for so long. So once you get to that point, and it's all the bureaucratic shit, he this is not what he signed up for, and he he didn't. He didn't develop the tools for that. And so we meet him in an existential crisis of a what next? What, I'm, what is my worth now? And the beautiful thing about starting the season that way, and I think it's brilliant, is that from that point, we just start seeing the cracks in his psychology. We see his fatal flaw. We see how he handles the loss of control one layer at a time. And then the loss to degrees of his son's affection. Falling, like this is what happens with teenagers and fathers and all the time is like, 
oh, you start seeing what your dad really is like, right? right? Seeing him in the daylight. Yeah, you but see that, him in the daylight. And so to, to lose that perception, that, that admiration from the only person who you love now in your life, that takes a huge, that alone takes a huge toll on him. That's fascinating to me, you know, the, the him knowing at every minute, every second of what the next move is, of what he wants, and he's striving and, and so strategic, but the one thing he didn't plan for is if, when he gets what he wants. Yeah, exactly. And how is he gonna continue from that? And so now he's adrift, yeah. because he had this want and this need pulling him forward, yeah. and now that's, and now he's adrift. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's that whole thing, dogs chasing cars, what do you do when you finally catch one? Yeah. <laughs> he caught the car and he's like, ah, I don't know what to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and everything up until that moment has been since he is a, a self made human under your full control. There's very little in his control in season six. Yeah. And so I'm really pumped for everyone to see what lies, the cracks in his psychology, and the even like the like inner child of this. this crazy mofo who is constantly showing us different facades that are slowly coming off in this season. And yeah, it's just so, it's just, it's been an honor to play this complex dude. And what? I hope people can, can get past the easy labels and like see what's, what's under there. Cause I think that might be helpful for seeing the people in the world who are oppressed and are willing to do whatever it takes to make sure that their children don't suffer in the same way they have. Well, thanks for coming to talk about it. Yeah. This is for Ashford! <laughs> <laughs> I'm just jumping I, in I, on it. I accept, I accept, I accept it all. Oh, that was awesome. Well, thank you guys for hanging out. That was uh, episode three, season six, and we'll be back uh, with the wonderful Kara G. Thanks, Keon. Thank, thank you, guys. Yeah, thanks, thank guys. you. Say goodbye, Ty. Goodbye, Ty. Goodbye, Ty. Say goodbye, Ty. Bye, Ty.